Hello! This video is part of a series on the history of Dalriada. It forms part of the Advanced Higher History course of Northern Britain from 0 AD through to 1063. This video is going to focus on the kingship, politics and war in the kingdom of early medieval Dalriada. So before we begin, I made a caveat, some historiographical comment. Uh, on establishing what was going on with the politics of Dalriada from Ewan Campbell. He notes that the primary sources we use are exceptionally difficult to untangle because of the layers of additions, translations and mistaken copying. Some modern historians would reject the possibility of constructing a meaningful story from these meagre sources. Now, in the last few decades, historians have indeed dedicated themselves to pulling apart the surviving sources we have in microscopic detail to build a narrative of what has gone on in early medieval Dariada over a thousand years ago. And some of what we're going to see today is going to reflect the current understanding of what those events entailed. Though obviously, as interpretations go on through time, perhaps this will also evolve. So to begin. So as we said in the intro, this video is split into three sections, kingship, politics and war. The first section, kingship, is going to focus on what it meant to be a king in Dalriada, how you were made a king in Dalriada, specifically the high king of Dalriada, and it's going to focus on the royal centre at Danad in the Comartan Valley. Now in a little while we're going to have something of a live tour of the site at Danad uh, to allow you to explore it from the comfort of your own home, especially in times such as these when travel is not so easy. I'm going to start off by using some of the information from the excellent information panels that you find when you come and visit Danad. Um, they give the visitor a bit of an insight into the site and helps them to interpret what was going on. So visitors to the NAD will find that it is a rocky outcrop in a sweeping flat plain. It's one of the widest valleys in the whole of Argyle. So climbing the steep rocky path into the heart of the fortress you will discover ruined ramparts, traces of buildings and a citadel with views across Argyle. Famously at the, you know, the top of the NAD is the inauguration stone where the High Kings of Dalriada were made. Now, the remarkable heritage of Danad um, slipped into obscurity, actually, uh, in the late medieval period into the modern age, and it wasn't really rediscovered, I guess, until the 1800s. Now, the Gales of Dalriada are known, or were known in the early medieval period, as the Scotty. They are arguably... Um, the core, the seeds of the Kingdom of Scotland or Alba that would come. And this is the very heart of their domain. It is a special place and Denad is firmly rooted in an ancient ancestral landscape of Camarton Glen. Now the early medieval Kingdom of Dalriada was riffing off the already ancient history that fills that valley. They were using the the monumental architecture of the place put there by the ancients thousands of years before them um, to build up the prestige of their own royal centre uh, when Dalriada rose to its height. So this importance didn't just fade away with the end of the Kingdom of Dalriada, it was still considered important enough for the reading of royal proclamations in the 1500s. That's even though the fact that hardly anyone actually lived there. Now this reconstruction of something of what Dariada may have looked like gives us a clue to how the site functioned. Now where Kilmartin Glen is, although it could be difficult to get to Iona nowadays by modern cars and ferries and still represents quite the trip, the Royal Centre of Denad has close links to Iona because it's only 37 miles away. In the early medieval period, the Rada's roads were either uh, tracks or just about non-existent. The easiest way to get around was by sea. Argyle is an archipelago. It's a series of peninsulas cut by sea loss. 
um, surrounded by a spray of islands, the easiest way to get around the Argyle before modern roads came around was by boat. And to get to Iona in the early medieval period, 37 miles away, is by no means that distant at all. Iona is in with easy access of this secular power centre. So the monasteries founder, St Columba, who was granted his island there by King Cowell um, of Dalriada in 563 AD, would build a, a Christian powerhouse that would work hand in hand with the kings based here in Danad. Now there's archaeological evidence that Danad becomes an international hub. Now, as mentioned in previous videos on Dalriada, um, Archaeological evidence has thrown up pottery shards and items that are manufactured in continental Europe and even further afield. It seems that diplomats, traders, royal refugees are recorded as coming here from all across Western Europe. The discovery of precious metals, rare minerals, pottery, glassware, it all reveals how well connected Danad was between the 6th and the 9th centuries AD. This is a hub for trade. Now, there is no archaeological evidence of the Gaels' legendary invasion of Argyll. Now, according to Bede, the Gaels came across from Ireland and they decimated, booted out, took over the indigenous population that were living in this part of northern Britain and took it for themselves. Ewan Campbell, in the late uh, 20th century, came along and did his best to disprove this theory. Uh, and his counterclaim is that the Scots of Dalriada were here all along separated by their mountainous landscape uh, from the other peoples of Northern Britain, it was far easier for the Gales living along the coast of Scotland to get in their boat and their car and commute across the Irish Sea to Ireland and trade with those groups over there than it was for them to troop across the rugged, boggy uh, and difficult to pass landscape. And over time, this ease of connection and trade between them and the Irish has led to a development of a very separate and different culture from what else was going on in Northern Britain at the time. Moving inside the Royal Fortress of Danad, as we're about to do in our, our um, lifetime visit, um, you can see from this picture that as you approach the citadel, there is a lot going on on the site. So things to look out for. Um, you can see from the picture here, there's a citadel right at the top on the left. This is the oldest heart of the site where the, the first fortified dun was placed. The grassy terrace to the front of the shot there um, had a massive rampart that surrounded it. And it seems to have held its use of workshops and buildings where some of these prestige items were being made. So it says then, we've got ourselves here a European citadel of culture. Archaeologists found traces of gold, silver, copper, lead and iron working mode, and more than 900 mould fragments, many for the making of brooches. Now, brooches like that one in the bottom left hand side of the picture were used uh, by the kings and handed out to their nobles as badges of prestige. They're made from precious metals. They are usually pieces of art in their own right and they'd have been worn on the chest to pin together the wearer's cloak. Wearing one of these would have been a badge of respect, a badge of honour. It shows that your service has been recognised by your overlord, by your king, and it is there on you for all to see. So by giving out gifts such as these, the king shows his patronage and he wins the loyalty of his followers. And it's here at Danad, Many of these brooches seem to be being made. And Danad and Dalriada had their height in the 6th through to the 7th centuries. Later on in the, the late 8th century and into the, oh, the disaster of the 9th century, Dalriada had certainly passed its peak. The Picts overcame them first. It says here, conquered in 736 AD by the very powerful Pictish warlord Angus More, Angus the Great, who came to Danad and sacked the site. And some believe that that marks the end of actual independence for the Dalriadans and afterwards they became a client kingdom to the Picts. 
Um, later on, uh, a century after this, the Vikings were taking their toll and Dalgada was unable to defend itself and collapsed under the weight of their raids and attacks. So what is the key importance of Danad? Danad is a royal inauguration site. It's where the Dalriadans made their high kings. Now, the site itself is entwined with the ceremony of inauguration. The ceremony itself took place near the summit on the inauguration stone, which we'll see in a wee second or two. It represents the king's marriage to and control over the land. On the inauguration stone, as he was crowned, the king would place his bare foot, we believe, into a carved footprint into the actual rock. It represents the king's physical connection to his land. It represents under his foot. The land is under his control. From the footprint where the action takes place, Ben Kurken, the highest mountain in Argyll and in the, in the domain of Dalyada, is visible. Dunad is also surrounded by the densest concentration of early prehistoric burial monuments in Northern Britain. The valley has a henge and a cursus, so a, a line of cairns and monuments all the way down the valley. It's a stone circle, it has standing stones, there are Bronze Age and older kist burials in tombs and cairns, there are chambered cairns, and there are ancient, ancient rock carvings um, scattered in places around the valley. This is a place that monumentally was important and was a site of prestige for thousands of years before Dalyada reached its height in the 7th century AD. And this is the inauguration stone just on the shoulder of Danad Hill. Now, the slab itself was um, being eroded in the 1970s and it was causing alarm to archaeologists. So what we see today is actually a replica, and a very, very good replica, concrete slab that was helicoptered in and placed directly on top of the original. It is made to be as close to what it covers as possible. It includes the carved footprint, which you can just make out in the, the middle of the shot on the slab. It also has a carved bore. A bit more on that later, and a rock cut basin right at the fore of the shot. It's possibly for libations um, by priests during the inauguration ceremony, and there is an Orm inscription, um, a little bit more on that too, um, that translates into Gaelic, not Pictish, and um, that possibly represents or um, mentions the significance of the nearby occupants of the Camarthen Valley to the the coronation ceremonies that took place here. This shot here from the information panel right next to the inauguration stone gives a bit more information. Um, you can see in the bottom of the shot there are the three pictures. We've got the, the footprint and then we have the faint outline of the boar. Now, some historians um, have contended that, that the boar is graffiti by the Picts when Angus Moore came here in the 730s and conquered this site. This is the, the Picts going right to the heart of their enemy and graffitiing one of the most um, symbolically important places in the whole of their kingdom um, with what is a famously Pictish symbol. Other possibly more modern historical interpretations uh, point out that the, the boar is a Celtic symbol. It's not just limited to the Picts themselves. And as a Celtic symbol, it implies kingship and the most prestigious of power. And this is obviously the, the perfect site for such a symbol to be placed. This is where you made high kings. So why not have the symbol of a boar? It symbolises kingship. So the, the boar itself could be something that is older than the, the Pictish um, vandals that came here in the 8th century. To the bottom right, there is, if you can see the little flecks in the, the stone next to those ridges, this is Oum. So this is a script that was etched into, we think, trees and wooden logs, also onto the edge of uh, standing stones, primarily in Ireland. There's a few examples of this in um, Argyll in the west of Scotland. Um, this is a very kind of basic script that um, is based on little hash marks like these against a, a central line numbering between one and four. They either cross the line or they're oblique to it or horizontal to it. 
depending on how they meet that um, vertical line is how you read the, the symbols. So a little bit more on what those um, markings could possibly mean um, when we visit the site live. So in this section of the video, I am going to visit Denad and give you a bit of a tour of the site and interpret what is going on with the architecture of it. And before we begin, I do apologise for my uh, choice of trousers <laughs> going into this. Oh dear, what was I thinking? Um, but here we go. Please do enjoy. The Hill of Dunad in Kilmartin Glen in Mid Argyll is the royal centre of the ancient kingdom of Dalriada. On the hilltop behind me, the kings of the different kennels of Dalriada would gather here to crown their king. Let's go and explore. This rampart here, the living rock that comes around the shoulder of the hill, was cut through in the 8th century when they remodelled Dunad to make it a site of prestige, a site of spectacle and of show. They cut the entrance through here, neglecting the old way in over that side of the hill, so that visitors approaching the Royal Citadel would look straight up and their line of sight was drawn to that grassy ridge just behind me. That is where the footprint site is. So visitors arriving into the Royal Stronghold will be looking up and watching the space where the kings of Dalriada were crowned. The language of prestige is really strong here. The site was remodelled to make a statement of power. If I was a visitor to the royal inauguration of the kings of Dalriada in the 8th century, I would enter through the monumental gateway just behind me there, into this enclosure just below the Royal Citadel. The rampart wall that runs round the circuit here on the shoulder of the hill would obscure my line of sight to the outside world. I would be contained within the world of the kings, contained within the amphitheatre of this royal ceremony. This is all about show, this is about impressing the people that come to see the making of their new king. We're inside the circuit of the main rampart here. You can see it yeah, follows the circuit round behind me. There's the 8th century cleft cut in the, the rock for the new ceremonial entrance when they remodeled the site. If you kind of follow me round, the line of the rampart follows along behind me. And just with the sun behind me over here, this is the level of the old entrance over here, which comes up a much more shallow incline to enter the enclosure. Working around here, the space that we're currently standing in would be full of uh, buildings like workshops. We know there was a, a smithy here that was making the jewellery and the ornamentation, the brooches that the kings of Dalriada were given out as symbols of prestige to the warriors and the retainers. We found the brooch molds for these here when the site was excavated. Up there on the hill behind me is the citadel. So that is where the old original dun was, the smallest part of the uh, Danad when it was first uh, fortified. And then on the ridge just to the right of that is the place the, the footprint is where the Royal Inauguration Ceremony would take place. Over this side over here is the well, where the water supply for Dunad was. And the cleft just to the side over there is the access to the citadel itself. Massive stone rampart which would have been held together with a timber lacework surrounded the shoulder of the fort here at Dunad, protecting the Royal Enclosure. But this wall wasn't only about protection, this wall is about prestige, it's about display of power. And within the enclosure itself, it's going to wall the occupants off from the outside world, contain them in this amphitheatre, this bubble of the royal ceremony that's happening above them. And for people in the valley below, this wall would have been visible for miles around. It's a statement of power, it shows what man can do to change the landscape, and it's a symbol of the power of the kings of Dalriada who owned this site. So this is the heart of the citadel, this is where the royal ceremony to meet the kings would really come, come to life. So behind the camera just now, down in the, the enclosure on the shoulder of the hill, we can imagine the king to be waiting with his retainers, ready to be called. And he'd make his way up past me, up through the cleft here, and onto the ridge of the hill there, 
the royal footprint weighs. The inauguration stone, where the king-to-be would place his foot to symbolise that he is now the master of this land. The king-to-be would make his way up here with the abbot of Iona to symbolise the acknowledgement, the support, the authority of the church, supporting the crown. We're waiting for him to enact the ceremony. To the inauguration slab here. That footprint is where the king to be would place his foot, signifying his ownership of the land of Dalriada. The abbot of Ion will be waiting here to baptize him into the faith as he uh, took on the crown. And this carved divot in the rock here is the water we gather for a fun, baptize and anoint the new king. That's what they didn't do at winter time. And you can't come to the Nad without having a go and doing it yourself. So, here we go. This is what it'd be like in the inauguration ceremony for the kings of Dalriada, possibly. This is going to be cold. <laughs> Once you have your bare foot, which symbolises a connection between the you, the king, and the landscape itself. Judging by the shoe size, he is probably about a size 6 or 7. Oh Jesus, it's cold. Here we are. This how the king symbolised the connection with the land of Dalriada. And I can just say he's probably about a size 8 or 9. And this is the view from the top. The Moynimor, the Great Bog. The land has been improved since the early medieval period. But this would have once surrounded almost the entirety of Danad, protecting it from attack from land. Looking at some pictures at the top of the site, um, when you are standing next to the inauguration stone here, look at the view in the background. Kumaran Glen is one of the widest open flat valleys in Argyll. To be fair, it is very boggy uh, since improvements in agriculture in the 18th century, it has been drained partly, but it gives you an idea of the view of these early medieval kings as they, they took up their crown on their inauguration stone. Look at what they see, they see their domain and it stretches wide before them. This is a striking relationship here shown between the ruler of the land and the broad expanse of his domain before him. This view is from the actual citadel, so right at the top of Danad. There's a surviving uh, fragment of wall up here. Now, it's not sure um, if this area here was roofed. It's quite a large space to have had one single roof. Um, we believe there was a, a dun that encircled the top of the height of Danad. Um, this would have been, I guess, the royal enclosure where the, the king would have stayed or had his dwellings. And... Once again, in the background, you can see this the giant sweep of land that the kings up here would have been able to, to look down upon. It's a position of prestige and power. Anyone approaching Danad would have had to look up and see, the, I guess, the, the spot where their king lived. This is quite a crude digital reconstruction of what Danad may have looked like. It's a few years old now. Um, but it's quite difficult, actually, to come across many reconstructions of what the site could have looked like. Um, you can see the, the structure, the dun, right on the, the summit of Danad is in this one, roofed anyway, but you can see looking at just how big that roof would have had to have been to have covered the whole part of that site. And there's a representation of the massive monumental rampart that surrounded the terrace and you can see some buildings where the jewellers and the metal workers may have worked down at the bottom. Just above where the fire is shown is smouldering away and um, there's a hut in the background behind the smoke. Next to that is the well that would have provided drinking water for the site. So who are these men that are becoming the High Kings of Dalriada? 
Dariada was a kingdom that was divided um, into kennels or kennela. Now the whole footprint of Dariada is pretty close to modern day Argyll. Um, but in the early medieval period, this is not one big unified kingdom. These different kennels all vie for power um, to put their man or their king forward as the, the high king of Dariada and to, to rule the wider space. Um, certainly earlier on in the, the recorded history of Dariada, it doesn't seem to be that the high king of Dariada actually ruled the entirety of what is shaded in the map here. Um, although that seems to have been the case um, perhaps from the 8th century onwards. So going through the different kennel um, that fed into providing high kings. On the top left we've got Kennel Lorne. Their royal seat is Dunolly. This is just outside Oban. Now the ivy encrusted tower that we see up there is a much later um, high medieval edition. Um, in the early medieval period the site would have been occupied but it certainly wouldn't have looked like that. Um, to the top right we have Kennel Cowell's seat at Donegoyle Hill Fort at the southern tip of Butte. And they would have controlled the island of Butte and much of Cowell. Kennel Gabran, the bottom right, is based in Kintyre. It's shaded yellow on the central map there. They seem to have held iron as well. So their lands stretch from the southern tip uh, down at Danaverty, where their royal seat would have been, um, all the way up to Danad. Now, Danad uh, seems to have been very much, interestingly, a frontier district between the different kennels of Dalriada. The two most powerful ones were Gibran and Lorne. And Danad sits very close to the border between the two. So it would not have been, we think, a constantly occupied royal seat. It's a ceremonial centre for the wider kingdom. So the king, the high king, would have gone there for important events, ceremonies, festivals. But it's doubtful that it would have functioned as a capital space that would have been permanently occupied by the high king. In the bottom right, we've got King Alangusa. Uh, which is based in Isla, and this is Finlagen, um, where their royal seat was. So that's a internal loch in Isla, and you can see the kind of low stone structure in the background. There. It's on a little kind of peninsula that you access now by a bridge. It's quite a marshy stretch of land that separates it from the the shore of the loch, and then out of that again is the circular um, Isle of the Council, um, which is no longer accessible just by foot. It possibly have been accessed by by uh, boat in the period of its use. So these different kennels, how did they work in terms of the kingship of Dalriada? So there is an over king who is selected from amongst the different kennel. One of their kings will go forward to become the over king of wider Dalriada. At the start of the, the recorded history of Dalriada, that seems to come chiefly from the kennel Gabran. Now, Kennel Gabran um, worked very closely with Kennel Cowell and together they were called the Corcureti. It seems to be until certainly the 650s, 660s that they took turns. So one king would be from Kennel Gabran and then it would flip across to basically a cousin who would be the king of Kennel Cowell and then they'd have a king, a turn at kingship. And then when the, that king died, it would revert back to the other kennel and it would go back to Kennel Gabran and so on. They were supposed to share from one family line to the other. So what does this relationship look like? So the over king would then for therefore be in charge of the other kennela. So the high over king in Kennel Gabran would for instance be the boss of the sub king of uh, Kennel Lorn, up near Robin. And this is how the system of authority works. So the king would be in charge of his own local uh, aristocracy within his kennel and they would have oversight over the peasants who would pay their dues and taxes to the aristocracy who would thereafter pay their dues and taxes taxes to the sub king who would then pay respects to the over king. So the over king provides their subjects with protection because they can call in the wider army. They judge disputes between the different um, nobles and sub kings across Dalriada and they held feasts and they gave gifts. This is all about the contract of respect and um, service. So the king provides a service to his people and in return his people pay him respects and loyalty. So this process is replicated in the other Kenla and within his own. 
So we've got the sub-king of King Angusa and the sub-king of King Ocal, all paying respects to the over-king. And in return for his gift of protection, judgments and patronage, the Kenla have to provide warriors for ships and they provide tribute to the Overking. The Overking needs resources if he's going to be handing out uh, gifts to his nobles in the form of his patronage. When it comes to times of war or raiding, um, based on the number of people that live in the, the kennel, then they have to provide a number of ships or fighting men. There's a document we're going to come across called the Census Fernabin, which uh, is going to, oh, the next slide, tell us how much exactly each Kenlant needs to provide to their overking. Now, Dariada went through a, quite a seismic political change in the 8th century. Um, Kenel Gabran and Kenel Kyle had shared between them uh, the position of overking for the early years or decades of Dariada's height. Um, then, from round about the, the later um, 7th century and certainly into the 8th, Kino Lorne uh, rise as the major power in Dalriada and the overkingship is more chiefly held by them and Gabran starts to fade uh, in power. And this change in power base is uh, what possibly informs the reconstruction of Danad as a, a centre of prestige. They need to remake it in order to build their prestige as the new overkings of Dalriada. So the census fair at Alban is the history of the men of Scotland. It's compiled in the 10th century AD, um, but it refers to information about Dalriada, its accounts, its statistics, its records um, from as far back as the 6th century AD. Its purpose was to assess the fighting strength of each area, to assess tribute due from the households, and it lists family subdivisions and the number of households in each of the Kenla of Dalriada. Each family supplied a quota of warriors for the navy as well. So it's an example of administration. It's evidence of quite a sophisticated, literate kingdom. Now here's an excerpt from the census. It's actually quite a short document, even though it's historically extremely important. Um, it's not very long. But here we go. Um, it says, Coiled Up has 30 houses. Ewan Garb has 30 houses. His wife is Crodu, daughter of Dallas, son of Ewan, son of Niall. Ferna has 15 houses. Ewan has five houses. And Baitan has five houses. Interesting, some of those names um, are still familiar to us today, more than a thousand years later. Some, obviously, of Baitan clearly have had their day. But this is a record of who is living in the kingdoms of Dariada. Um, so in itself, some historians have used it to work out and estimate the population of Dariada and what that must have been. Historian Leslie Alcock um, estimated using the census fair in Alban that the population of early medieval Dariada must have been around about 20,000 people um, who would have been able to provide soldiers for an army of up to 2,000 strong. Now, a document like the census fair in Alban shows an advanced society. It is the, the first census on the island of Britain, certainly since the Romans um, cleared out. But it shows that they have a royal household who are keeping records of their kingdom uh, is evidence of a development of a bureaucracy. This is a sophisticated government. These are not just a bunch of armed thugs threatening people and making wars on everyone they see. This is an ordered state with structure, with laws, with records. It almost sounds a bit modern. They must have had literate officials in the king's retinue. And herein we see the benefits that uh, Dalriada's close association with the Christian monks of Iona um, has brought. Monks are literate, they read and they write, and they are therefore skilled individuals, educated individuals that bring side benefits to any kingdom that they work with. The side benefit here for Dalriada is that the literacy of the people working at the top of the domain or with them in terms of the priests means that they've been able to develop this bureaucracy. This tightly structured system of records gives them an awareness of their kingdom and it must have made rulership 
of these lands much more efficient than of the lands that border them. So kingship is, in early medieval Dariada, quite a modern institution. The second part of this video is going to look at the politics of Dariada. So what was going on in their relations with the neighbouring kingdoms of Northern Britain at uh, this time? One of the things that jumps out straight away is the alliances they made. There were numerous political marriages amongst the elites of Dariada, and this is common for most of the Northern British kingdoms. During their height in the late 6th century, uh, through to uh, the end of King Aidan's reign in 609 AD, um, we hear that King Aidan himself married several times, and it wasn't he was replacing dead wives with new ones, it was he had several on the go at the same time. We know that St Columba was a bit salty about the fact that Aidan was married more than once, but he seems to have married British and Pictish princesses, so he is making marriage ties with more than one neighbouring kingdom at a time. Aidan's own daughter was married to an Irish king, so we can see that he is not just staying in mainland Britain, he's also got his finger in the pie over in Ireland as well, with all his many different uh, minor kingdoms. So there is, however, a bit of a questionable authenticity about these accounts. We need to be a wee bit careful with them. It was convenient for later historians to go back into the histories of these domains and insert false members of genealogies um, to create marriages to show supposed historical links that would substantiate uh, the kings of the days when they were writing. So it may have been useful for, some, for someone in the 10th century to have been related to one of the almost legendary famous kings of 7th century Dalriada, so they would insert some fictitious link. Historians are getting much, much better at being able to spot these late insertions, but we still need to be a wee bit careful with what's going on. But however, from this, it is it's still clear that political marriage was an important form of alliance building in this period. So alliances were also made through political guests. Northumbrian princes Oswald and Oswiu lived in exile in Dalriada in the early 600s. They were guests of the Scottish king. Now this politically ended up having massive importance for the next hundred years of history in Northern Britain. So it was here that Oswald was converted. He'd arrived as a pagan Saxon, but he took Christianity back to Northumbria with him when he returned from his exile. Now, Oswald and Oswiu became massive in terms of their importance in Northern British history. Oswald's father, Athelfrith, was a successful Bernician ruler. Now, on our map here, we got Northumbrians marked on the northeastern side of what we would recognise of as England. Um, but Northumbria in AD 600 hadn't quite come into existence as a unified kingdom yet. It was made up of two kingdoms, Bernicia, you can see up in the top right, uh, where modern day Lothian and Northumberland is. And then south of that, we've got Deira, which is modern day Yorkshire. So Oswald's father, Ethelfrith, was a successful Bernician ruler, who after some years in power in Bernicia, also managed to become the king of Deira. And thus, he was the first to rule both of the kingdoms, um, which would become... Uh, Northumbria in time, but haven't quite arrived there yet. Now, Athelfrith, who was for years a successful war leader, especially against the native British, as we can see marked to in grey to the west of the Saxon domains, was eventually killed in a battle uh, around 616 by Redwald of East Anglia, uh, which is modern day kind of Norfolk and Suffolk. So this defeat meant that an exiled member of the Deer and Royal Line, a man called Edwin, who was Oswald and Oswiu's uncle, um, became the king of Bernicia and Deira. Oswald's mother, Queen Acca, fled north. She knew that if Edwin got his hands on his nephews, he would have to kill them because they're obviously going to grow up and become rivals to him in the future. So she flees and she ran northwest and she ends up uh, in Dalriada. Now, Oswald then spent the remainder of his youth in the Scottish kingdom of Dalriada. He was converted to Christianity by the Owen and Monks. He was raised in the, the Dalriadan way, and he was also trained as a warrior by the Dalriadans. We think he may also have fought in Ireland during this period of exile. But it's clear that he spent 
his formative years um, with the Dalry Adams. And when he does return, once he's grown to manhood and politically the time is right and he makes his return to retake his kingdom from his bad old uncle, um, he brings with him Dalry Adams ideas of Christianity and how to run a state. And he and his brother mould the kingdom of Northumbria and they make it into the most powerful kingdom in the whole of Northern Britain. Now that buys Dalriada some extremely powerful friends and it also spreads Ionian Christianity all the way across the northern half of the British Isles. So it makes the Ionian church extremely powerful as well. So we can see the alliances that Dalriada is building are having quite a widespread effect upon Northern Britain and are also very good for building their prestige and their wider power. Another example of alliances are <coughs> diplomatic missions. We know from Adonan's biography of Columba that he visited King Brady of Pickland. So Iona is on the west coast of Scotland, obviously just west of uh, Mull. And it seems that Columba must have made his way across Mull up into Appen at the bottom end of Loch Ness. Up the Great Glen, as we can see in the, the picture on the right of the slide here. Um, and he's made his way up to the royal centre of the Northern Picts at Craig Fadrig. You see a reconstruction of their hill fort in the bottom right, um, where Brady has his seat. Now, ostensibly, Columba went there to try and convert the Northern Picts to Christianity. Now, whether or not he's successful is ooh, a bit of a moot point. But it does show, however, that there are important uh, leading figures within the Dalryadan domain who are on missions to create links with their neighbours. Now, Columba was a busy man. He was abbot of Iona for... 34 years and he became an extremely respected figure remember he wasn't just the abbot of Iona he was also a northern Irish prince and um, so he brings a lot of political uh, prestige um, with him um, in terms of a secular background as well as, rel as his religious one so Columba was present at the convention of drum set in 575 now that was in northern Ireland at Limavady um, it seems to be where King Aidan of Dalriada formally separates um, Irish Dalriada from his kingdom and the two are able to politically go their own way. Dalriada of Northern Britain um, still has a role to play in Northern Irish politics for many years still to come. Um, but being able to pick apart just who's in charge of what, it sometimes can be quite tricky. They have very close ties to their um, Irish cousins. Now, Domnan, the biographer of Columba, the man who wrote his life story, um, was also asked by a king of Ireland to secure the release of hostages from the Northumbrian king, Ulfrith. He gave Ulfrith his book, The Law of Innocence, and the hostages were released. So once again, we see important figures within the, the kingdom of Dalriada working on the international stage. Now, Swapping a book for some prisoners may seem a bit of a kind of mm, bum bargain nowadays, but bear in mind just how valuable books were in the early medieval period, what they're made of. So vellum of cowskin represents literally liquidizing your wealth. Um, so remember, this is a, a state that doesn't use coin um, for barter and exchange. We use um, items to swap. And cows are one of the most precious items available at the time. And they're a source of food. They're also a source of resources like their skin, which can be turned into leather or stretched out to make vellum to write these books on. So a dominant giving a book to a king is actually um, quite the treasure that has been exchanged for these prisoners. We're talking about the kings of Northumbria. Um, if anyone's ever watched the TV series Vikings, uh, they may be familiar with this uh, fellow up in the top left, Ayla. Um, now, the TV series Vikings does not quite get him right. He's, um, it was long gone by the time the Vikings showed up. But the kings of Northumbria um, are important diplomatic allies of the Dalriadans. Uh, we can see their family tree here. Now, um, Oswiu, right at the heart of that, um, is the, the king that really projects uh, Northumbria um, and catapults them forward and makes them the, the leading nation of Northern Britain. Um, in the first half of the 7th century AD. We can see um, on the family tree just to the left of him is older brother Oswald, 
that he was in XL with Osweyu and Dalyada, and the two returned to uh, North East England at the same time together. Oswald, as the elder brother, got to be the king um, first of those two, um, though he was killed by a pagan king called Penda. And then Oswald took over and he really uh, transformed Northumbria's fortunes. You can see in amongst them there's another brother, the second one, Ianfrith. He went into exile with um, the Picts and he came back to uh, try and uh, play his hand at getting his crown back and it didn't work out quite so well for him. Um, Oswiu had two wives. The first one, whilst he was in Dalriada, interestingly, building relationships again, he seems to have married an Irish princess, Finn. Um, all this was disputed by later historians, and they had a child called Aldfrith. Uh, when Oswiu went back to uh, Northumbria, he left um, Finn behind, and he married, um, somewhat creepily, his cousin, Jan Fled, um, his uncle, who was deposed by um, Oswald and Anfrith, um to keep his uncle's, I guess, followers on side, um, Oswiu marries his uncle's daughter and they produce many, many children. And you can see down the bottom there, uh, a series of them will get to be the, the following kings of Northumbria. But when that side of the line dies out in 685 with the death of King Edgefrith when he came up to fight the Picts, um, they cast around looking for other members of the royal family who could take over and they found this semi-disputed child to the Irish princess, um, a man called Oldfrith, and he gets to become the, the next king of Northumbria. Um, so we can see that Dalriada plays quite an influential role through diplomacy and the alliances it made um, in the kingdoms round about them. Another um, example of the political influence of Dalriada can be seen in Adonan's Law of Innocence, or the Cain Adonan. Adonan, as abbot of Iona, was apparently visiting Pictland uh, when he came across a battlefield, a recently vacated battlefield, and on it he saw the dead body of a woman who'd been taking part in the fighting. Next to that woman's body was a screaming child, her child, um, crying over his dead mother. And Adonan was so moved by what he saw that he proposed that women should not be put in harm's way, should not be allowed to fight. And this law would become the law of innocence. Now, he managed to get over 50 kings in Northern Britain to agree to this and to sign it. 50 kings. So that shows, first of all, just how fractious politically Northern Britain must have been. That's an incredible number of kings. Um, but secondly, it also shows the influence of Dalriada, the influence of Adonan and the, the Church of Columba at that time to get so many people to sign up to something that potentially had such a, a seismic effect in changing what was going on in society. The third aspect of this video looks at the Dalriadan involvement with war. So based on the records we have for them, where have these wars taken place? It seems that the Dalriadans were mostly friendly with the British Kingdom, so that uh, really means the Brits of Altclut, the ones based at Dumbarton Rock, which would later become the Kingdom of Strathclyde. They are often at war with Pickland, which for Dalriada is to the north and to the east. And there seems to be a measure of infighting which took place within Dalriada between the different kennels. It often wasn't a smooth transition from one overking to the next. Once the overking was in place, they were not usually challenged, although there are examples such as Domino Breck in the 630s and 640s, who was so fantastically bad as a king, he's not recorded as winning one single fight that he seems to have been overthrown and replaced um, by another kennel. And fighting often seems to happen between the kindreds. There are accounts of battles between Kennel Gabran and Kennel Lorne, sometimes on land, sometimes at sea. So why are they fighting so often? As you can see on this map, there are various arrows which show where the Dalriadan armies seems to have swept across. Why are they fighting so much? Some of it seems to be raids for economic gain. There are main source for what's going on in early medieval Dalriada is the Irish annals. So it's the chronicles kept by monks living at various different Irish monasteries. And the monks record certainly the death of kings and princes. They record wars and significant battles, but they don't really often record raids. It seems that raids 
were a part of early medieval society and accepted part of early medieval life. Uh, the king would, or the warlord, would gather his retinue of soldiers, a corps of basically semi-professional fighting men, and every year they would go off and raid. They would pick neighbours, maybe not so close neighbours sometimes, and they would ride off or sail off and they'd go plunder and raid and then come back home with the spoils. It gives the king a chance to train and exercise his warriors. It also gives him a chance to take plunder, which he can then use as a resource to hand out to honour his warriors and to renew those ties of loyalty. Um, or he could use it as um, collateral to give gifts to other kingdoms and states. It seems to be an accepted part of the practice of what it was to live in early medieval society. Many different groups seem to have done it. Um, they could also have fought to defend against enemy expansion. Um, the politics of Northern Britain mean that some kingdoms come, some go. Power of different groups wax and wane. And this often comes hand in hand with wars and invasions and fighting. Sometimes uh, Northern British kingdoms may have fought to exact tribute. If a kingdom is able to defeat another in a war, it's often the case that they don't simply occupy or take over that space because they don't have the, the people or the resources to do so. So the defeated kingdom instead would pay tribute to the victors. So every year they would have to pay in a share of their resources to the, the kingdom that conquered them. Um, and sometimes that um, promise may need to be backed up with military action if they're trying to get out um, from under the thumb of the people who defeated them. Warfare was not for the expansion of Dariada. As I said, the population of Dariada, which is about the same territorial scope as modern day Argyll, was around about, we think, 20,000 people. They don't have the manpower on the ground to spread out and to occupy vast swathes of northern Britain. So even though, as we can see on the arrows here, that they are campaigning away in Orkney, they're in what we would call modern-day England, so they're fighting over in Northumbria. Um, the Dalryadans are not conquering and keeping that land between Dalryada and the places where they're going to fight. They're going to try and win power and authority over these kingdoms, but not to expand and to take the land. They don't have enough warriors and people on the ground to stay and to occupy these places. So these are not wars of expansion. So how did they fight? What do we know about them? According to the census, uh, the 10th century document, in the AD 600s, um, Dalriada had 2,000 or so fighting men available. Now those are the ones that are legally, according to the census, supposed to turn up to fight. It may have been that the army was bigger or smaller, depending on the ups and downs of the population, but also on how popular the king was um, at the time. So a powerful, well-respected king may have attracted additional people uh, other than the ones who just had to show up to come and fight for his army. Maybe there was the promise of plunder or the promise of glory and success. So maybe it was a battle that the, the kingdom were, were motivated to fight and um, they were on the king's side. Sometimes the king may have had the wealth to employ mercenaries to come and augment his army as well. So the 2,000 men suggested by the census is by no means a fixed figure. It seems that the travel by boat, as I said before, Argyll is an island archipelago, so the, by far away the fastest way to get around from place to place is to go uh, by water. So they travel by boat in Kirks. There is a reconstruction of a small one on the right. Kirk is a wooden frame with... A leather skin stretched over it. Now, in the days before life jackets, I don't know if I'd be super trustworthy of this, but um, in a notable bit of experimental archaeology, they had a go at rebuilding one of these and they sailed it over the Pentland first. So they sailed from Orkney across one of the most dangerous stretches of water in the British Isles to the Scottish mainland. And just a bunch of archaeologists paddling away and they all made it alive. So these things are watertight and they are seaworthy. Uh, this seems to be what they used. The, the The benefit of boats like this is that they are light. So you can paddle your way across one loch, haul the boat out the water, turn it upside down, carry it above your head, over the next peninsula, into the next loch, and do the same there and get quickly around without having to sail all the way around the end of peninsulas to get back up the other side. So they are portable and very useful vessels to have. 
So the Dalry Arden army seems to travel by boat. Um, so we've got Curragh's like this one for raiding parties. Wooden ships for supplies, so obviously much kind of bigger and sturdier. Um, we've also got the Seven Venture Curragh. It needed 28 oarsmen to power it along. Now there's a cut down version of one down the bottom there, what it could have looked like. Um, those oarsmen were provided, according to the census, by a group of 20 houses. Overland marches were not as common. For weapons, the basic warriors seem to have used spears and bows, although armour, because it involved quite a lot of metal, which would have been expensive and quite a prestige item to, to have had. Um, armour is probably fairly rare, um, although padded jackets, leather armour may have been common. The aristocracy, um, with their access to better resources and more money, would have had um, swords, um, obviously higher metal, metal component, and crossbows uh, to use as well. Set battles seem to have occurred with hand-to-hand -hand combat. We know that from early medieval poems like the Godothan and the Beowulf, and archaeological evidence and accounts from the, the early annals show us that sieges occurred of forts. So there is quite a culture of warfare um, around in the early medieval period. Now, one of the most warlike and successful kings of Dalyada was Aidan MacGabran. Now, he was a uh, king from around about 574 to 609. It's an incredibly long stretch for a king of this period. And uh, he really, really took Dalriada forward. So he established its autonomy from the Irish Dalriadans. And he campaigned in Orkney. He campaigned far, far into Pickland. And he even tried to combat the rising power of the Saxons of Pernicia. Um, by leading his army as far afield as Dexistan, which we think, according to Alistair Moffat certainly, was in the modern day borders um, of far south Scotland. Unfortunately for Aidan on that day, though, he stretched his neck out too far and he lost that one. Um, which really, really actually signalled the beginning of the slow decline of Dalriada. This was the very, very height of their power, around about AD 600. We also have an account in AD 719 of a naval battle between the Kenel Gabran and the Kenel Lorne as they wrestled for control of Oida Dalriada. So it shows us that the Dalriadans were fighting sea battles as well as land battles. Now this image here is of Vikings obviously fighting in their longships uh, rather than Dalriadans uh, shown on the left there. It's actually quite hard to get some illustrations of Dalriadan naval battles for some reason. But it maybe gives us an idea of what a battle at sea would have been like in the early medieval period. And there might have been a bit of missile fire with bows and arrows as the two um, fleets approached each other. But when it came to the actual contact, the, the boats would pull alongside each other and the men would fight hand to hand um, as they tried to fight from boat to boat, taking control of the, the ship of the other side and forcing their soldiers over the side. It was warfare that eventually leads to the downfall of Dalriada. In AD 790s, a new type of people arrived. The Vikings. Now, this lot are going to be devastating to Dalriada. The first recorded hit of the Vikings on Dalriadan territory was uh, a strike in 795 on Iona. Within 50 years, the kingdom of Dariada would collapse under the weight of these attacks. They made everyone flee from Dariada. They had to abandon the coastline as the Dariadan armies, as they were, were not fast enough to respond to Viking raids. When the Vikings first came, they came as raiders. They would come out of nowhere with no warning. and We got boatloads of dozens of heavily armed men landing, attacking a community and able to disappear within a couple of hours before the Dalriadans would even be able to do anything about it. So this destroyed the the bond of obligation and that we saw earlier on in the video where the overlords would protect the people and um, they no longer could protect them and the Vikings showed that the, they were not capable of that. So the peasants lost faith in their lords they retreated from the coasts where it was dangerous to be because the Vikings could appear out of nowhere and just come and take you, enslave you, kill you, steal you. Um, and therefore, Dalriadan society just began to break down. People literally fled eastwards um, over the mountains and into Pickland to get away from the Vikings. 
Most of them did flee, including the elite and the aristocracy of the Ariadna, but not everyone. This may be familiar to some, is Old Castle Lachlan. Now the uh, McLachlans represent one family who didn't. McLachlans were the Jewers. They, according to Ewan Campbell, are the last vestige of Dalriad and Royal Authority left in Argyll. Some families stayed behind while the rest fled to keep an eye on the treasures and the holy places of their kingdom and their lands in the hope that one day they might be able to come back and retake their old ancestral homelands. Now to finish off our video, a bit of historiography and comment from Ewan Campbell. And the reason we keep talking about Ewan Campbell is this man is a giant in the field of Dalriadan history. He has worked on um, Dalriada for decades and this man knows just so much about it. So according to Ewan Campbell, Dalriada was not an obscure peripheral place, but it held an important place in the artistic, intellectual and political life of Northwestern Europe. Some of the artistic achievements, such as the Book of Kells and the Iona Stone Crosses, are among the world's greatest works of art. And we talked about these in an earlier video um, on the culture of Dalriada. We talked about just the, how incredible insular art was and how it developed. He goes on to say, Adonan's Law of Innocence, the Cain Adonan, it was the precursor of human rights legislation. It was a product of intellectual study combined with spiritual feeling. Now Campbell's hit it on the head in terms of what's going on in um, the monastery at Iona during the, the height of Dalriadan power. We have a centre of learning here, a centre of education and culture that is disseminating its ideas across the kingdom of Dalriada and further and beyond. So it makes Dalriada a kind of heartland for ideas um, that are spreading and filtering out across northern Britain. Those exiled Northumbrian princes who grew up um, within Dalriada took these ideas with them as they went back home to their own kingdom in Dira, Bernicia, which would become Northumbria. And then as they took power there themselves, they spread those ideas across Northern Britain. So um, Dalriada becomes a seat of learning for Britain. And finally, Campbell goes on to say, on a more mundane level, the bureaucratic organisation implied by the census may have contributed to the early development of the unified Scottish state, one of the earliest in Europe. These achievements were the result of a readiness by the Dalriadans to accept and integrate elements of other cultures allied to a strong emphasis on learning and artistic endeavour. So Dalriada did thrive. It was, although small, an important kingdom in terms of its impact upon the culture um, and ideas that spread across Northern Britain in the early medieval period. Had the Vikings not arrived and brought around their downfall in the late 8th and early 9th centuries, then it would have been truly fascinating to see what Dalriada could have achieved. And that's it for this video. Thanks very much for listening.